morning. Even the congregational hymns all the way through the special music. All right. We turn in our Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 8 and to Ephesians chapter 5. When you've found your place, please stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 1 in chapter 8 of Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I want to point out to you the expression, the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Again, the Spirit of of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. Aren't we grateful for the life of Christ in us? Verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned it in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is dead but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed it can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Let me just give a word right here. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, you're not a born again person. Well, born, born again, and we'll see in the next verse, means that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. But I want to say this to you. The lost man can never please God. Let me say to you that are here today, that are not saved, you've never been born again, there is no way you can please God except that God do a work of grace in you and therefore it is said you must be born again. And let me read verse 9 now. But ye are not in the flesh, but ye are in the Spirit. He's talking to the believer. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. There's that emphasis again. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I share with you that the Bible teaches us, and if Christ be in you, body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness let me just point out again to you he is called the spirit of life now one verse in Ephesians 5 one that we are primarily familiar with and that's uh, chapter 5 verse 18 here we have an imperative from God, a command from God. And God says, And be not drunk with wine where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now let me say that he has a contrast here between drunkenness and one being controlled by the Holy Spirit. We all know that a drunk is controlled by his alcohol. Amen. Well, every born again child of God should be controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells him. Amen. Uh, but the Bible says, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name as we continue to study of the person and work of the Holy Spirit that today you will help us to be clear in our understanding 
of what it means to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, and particularly to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Help us with these concepts today and give us insight on the truth of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you said in your word that the people of God should not grieve the Spirit of God whereby they were sealed. Lord, we don't want to grieve you today. Lord, we're, we're tired of a generation that grieves the Holy Spirit and then goes home to talk about religious activity. We want to be sensitive to you. And we want to walk in obedience to your word. We want you to use us. Lord, we want you to produce fruit through us. Make us channels. Make us channels today. Again, Father, there be one in our midst lost without Christ. May he or she come to know Jesus Christ before it's everlasting too late. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Be seated. Seems like we've been studying on the work and the person of the Holy Spirit for a long time. Uh, of course, the spaces in between make it seem longer. Uh, but uh, I want to just simply start this morning by talking about the different names that are given to the Holy Spirit. It's kind of a review, but it's important for us to continue our study in the direction that I feel God is leading. It's important for me to say this morning, there is a lot of ignorance about the person of the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's a lot of ignorance in our nation, in our land, and all over the world about who God is. There's a need for us to study our triune God. I remind you that He is God the Father, He is God the Son, He is God the Holy Spirit, yet one. Now, it's important that as we're looking at the person of the Holy Spirit, we recognize that the Holy Spirit's names indicate his character as well as his work. Now, let me just enumerate these right quickly and we'll get on to other parts of the study. This is somewhat review. But number one, the Holy Spirit. He is called the Holy Spirit. Uh, why is he called the Holy Spirit? Because he's God and he's holy. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, it says, How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? He is referred to in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, the Spirit of holiness. Uh, it's important that we understand that these verses speak of his moral character. Our God is holy. The most outstanding thing about God is not that he is a God of love. I'm thankful he is a God of love, but I'm grateful also that he is a God of holiness. Yes. And not only do we see in the word of God that the spirit is holy in himself, but he is the one that produces holiness in our lives. What Christ accomplished on the cross of Calvary in our redemption he makes real in our lives. Amen. I want to ask you today, is there a desire in your heart to be holy? Well, then I remind you, the one that put that passion in you is the Holy Spirit. He is also called the Spirit of Grace in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. It says, and had done despite unto the Spirit of Grace, talking about the enemy. And let me just go on to say, he is the executive of the Godhead that works out in our lives the spirit of grace. I love it. So if somebody says, I've got the grace of God operating in my life, that's because God has given you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit indwells us and works grace in our lives. He initiated our salvation. You weren't looking for God. I wasn't looking for God. But as uh, Brother Parsons says, he came to me. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
Bless the Lord for the day that he came to me and brought me under Holy Spirit conviction and regenerated me by the power of the Holy Spirit and granted me life in Amen. Christ Jesus. Amen. He also granted me repentance and faith. I had no repentance in me except it was a gift from the Holy Spirit. But praise be, unto God, praise be unto God, the Holy Spirit still lives in me and I'm still repenting all the way to heaven. Amen. Do you have a spirit of repentance? Do you have an attitude of repentance? Guess who gave you that attitude? The Holy Spirit. Who gave the spirit of faith? It's the Holy Spirit. Let me say thirdly, the spirit of fire. Now, when I was going through this before with you in the early days, it's been a long time. But in those early days, I talked about his being called the spirit of fire. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, was the words of our John the Baptist. And it's important to understand it was prophesied as early as Isaiah 4, 4. The spirit of fire, and it can be translated burn. Let me just say this to you. This tells us that God is a God of righteousness and of judgment. And he will judge us according to his righteousness. He is the spirit of judgment and he is the spirit of burning. Uh, when God destroyed the world the first time, he's destroyed it with water. But the next time, he will destroy it with fire. And let me go on and add to you that even the judgment seat of Christ teaches us that will stand before Jesus Christ. We will not be judged whether going to heaven or hell. That's already been established for the same of God. But what a blessing it is that when we come before him in Revelation chapter 1, he says that he will examine us. Our works shall be examined by the blazing gaze of fire that comes from his eyes. Let me share with you, judgment is certain. And I taught here on Wednesday night that our God is just and he always does justly. Amen. And let me remind you, he is the spirit of judgment and burning. Amen. He is the spirit of truth. I love that expression. It's found in John 14, 17, 15, 26, 16, 13. And in 1 John 5, 6, he is called the Spirit of Truth. Amen. Who's the author of our Bible? The Spirit of Truth. Amen. Who has said that if the anointing of the power of the Holy Spirit is upon you as you go forth, you'll be a witness unto me. Everything rises and falls on the power of the Holy Spirit doing what he does for us and through us. As God is love and the Holy Spirit is truth. You say, Pastor David, he is opposed to all error. That's right. And there is the spirit of error in this world. 1 John 4, 6 tells us that we should be aware of the fact that there are false teachers and there are those that have the message of the wicked spirits of hell that change themselves That's right. into light. But the best one of all, I come to last, the spirit of life. Amen. I want to say to you that if there is the life of Christ in you, it's because the spirit of life dwells in you. What a glorious thought. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law or the principles of sin and death. How do you overcome the devil? How do you overcome the world? How do you overcome your own old depraved flesh? You overcome by the spirit that indwells you. God's program in the world today is the local church. 
very important to understand the church is a New Testament concept. The church is not in the Old Testament. It is the most amazing society in the whole world. Aren't you glad you're a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Aren't you glad that you, I, I am? I'm glad to be a part of this local assembly. Because at Peach Street Baptist Church, we try to honor the Word of God. At Peach Street Baptist Church, we stand for the grace of God to transform and change lives as they're born again. Jesus began his church while on earth by laying the foundation. It is made up of Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, and we have learned in our studies on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. But the apostles were those that were entrusted with the doctrine. It was interesting, Jesus indoctrinated them, and they're called the doctrine. It is called the doctrine of the apostles. But I want to go on to point out to you, it also says that the foundation is made up of uh, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. Amen. So the book of Acts records the open manifestation of the church with the condescension of the Holy Spirit. The church was birthed without a committee. Amen. We get to thinking sometimes we can't do it if we don't set a committee aside to do it. The church was birthed without a committee. It had no great leaders. Not at the beginning. They came later by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. It had no great leaders. It had no financial sponsorship. Sometimes we get around looking around we just get a sponsor. Well, let me just say this to you. The greatest sponsor I know is the Holy Ghost. Amen. The greatest one to sponsor the causes and the purposes of the Godhead, the triune God, our God. The church is a place without, in its beginning, financial sponsorship. It was primarily made up of uneducated men. Oh, boy, that went out the window, didn't it? <laughs> and it was born amidst a hostile society who, humanly speaking, had power to easily destroy. But they couldn't. Amen. 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 You say, Pastor, why could they not? Because Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Because of the mighty power of the Holy Spirit is the second reason why. He is working God's eternal purposes through his elect people. Yes. They're called the church of the living God. Why do they call us the church of the living God? Because the Holy Spirit has made us alive of the almighty God. Amen. He quickened us. We were dead in trespasses and sin. Had no desire forgotten of the things of God. But he made us alive. He quickened us. And he gave us a desire for Almighty God. And the purpose is God. And the program of God. We are not satisfied just to be a member of the church. We want to be controlled by the Spirit of God. And we are in fact commanded by Almighty God to be Spirit-filled. Let me just say this to you. The ignorance in our churches today is hurting us greatly. We've allowed the charismatics to come in and take over the teaching on the person of the Holy Spirit. I got news for you. The Baptists that have been true to the scriptures through the ages had, a, had an insight on the Holy Spirit before that crowd ever got here. Right. And you say, well, Pastor David, they've been here all the time. No, they've not been here all the time. Now, they got started about the early 1900s. Right. And let me just say this to you. All that the saints of God are from grace to glory may be traced back to the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's time for us not only to worship the Father, because it tells us that the ministry of the Holy Spirit 
magnifies the Father in our hearts. Amen. Glory to God. He's our comforter. And let me just go on and point out to you that the Holy Spirit magnifies Jesus Christ. Praise be to God for every church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit to enable them to exalt and to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a precious memory for me when Christ Jesus became real in my life. I was taught by my mother and my grandparents and even my father on occasion that salvation is of the Lord and that Christ Jesus paid the sinner's debt. But I heard that and I believed it. I even studied it as a young person to know what it meant. But then one day he quickened me. Right. One day he came by to where I was. I was loathsome. I was wicked. Like in Ezekiel 16, description of Israel, that she was uh, like a, a baby that's been un, un, a swallowed, that's not been bathed and prepared. And then he said that I came by. He said, one day I came by and I found you. The wolves would have destroyed you because they left you in the field. Let me just say this. When Satan got through with us in the fall, let me remind you, we were against God. And we were, because Adam and Eve sinned and willfully did it, we became aggravatedly hate, full of hatred against Almighty God. I mean, it's not just that I'm a sinner by nature, but by an active means of being against Almighty God because of my nature. So I'm guilty both by birth as a sinner, but I'm a sinner by acts and deeds before God ever saved me. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary for our salvation. Let me just let me just say this. Because we are totally depraved. Because we're dead in trespasses and sin. A dead man doesn't look for God. Dead man lies in his deadness. But praise God, aren't you grateful that there was a day that God came by where we were, lonesome as we were in the world in the wickedness of the fields of this world. And he said, live. He came by and said, live. He said, I spoke and the nation of Israel lived. And he says to me and to you, praise God, he came by and said, live. And we live today because of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Man is dead in trespasses and sin. The sin nature and the sin in us is not neutral. You're not just up on the fence and you can jump one way or the other and then all of a sudden you choose to jump in on God's side and you're okay. That's not how it works. You're dead. You're dead in trespasses and sin and you must be quickened. You must be made alive unto God. Praise be to God for the power of the Holy Spirit. Because man must receive a new nature. Now listen to me, young people, and I'm saying this to you in love. I'm not angry or not mad, but I'm simply saying some of you live more like you're not saved than you are saved. Now, I could go for adults too, can it not? Because man must receive a new nature. It's not good enough. I can't, I must say it. This was from the gift, from the very beginning, but the gift of pardon sins would be worthless. Let me say that again. The gift of our sins being forgiven would not be enough if we didn't receive a new life in Christ Jesus. You gotta be born again. You've got to experience. This work of the Holy Spirit in your own heart and in your own life. 
That's what the Holy Spirit does. So the gift of pardon sins would be worthless without the gift of a new nature and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's powerful stuff. Let me just go on to say to you, the Spirit leads us. And uh, the idea of being Spirit-led that we started out with from the beginning of our teaching, the idea of being Spirit-led is that we as individuals are experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit active in every area of our lives as we submit ourselves to Him. What a blessed thought. That's the reason He teaches us in uh, uh, such places as the Spirit of God beareth witness with our spirit that we're sons of God. Now, I've already run down this trail, so I don't want to go down it again this morning, but I want to say this to you. People that are born again, the Spirit of God bears witness with their spirit. Right. Right. I mean, you can't sit in a congregation like this and hear the songs of Zion and hear the preaching of the Word of God, particularly the teaching of the Scriptures, without something in you. If you're a born-again child of God, there's something in you that says, Amen to the truth of God you have heard. Is that voice in your spirit saying amen when you hear the truth of God's word? That's the evidence of being born again. And let me just go on to say that the Bible says where there is no spirit, there is no life. God help us to understand there in Romans 8, if you have not the spirit of God, you're still carnal, you're still in the world, and you're still in the flesh. Being born again means that God has gifted you with the person of the Holy Spirit to live in you. That blows my mind. The eternal God of glory, the Spirit that moved upon the forms that were spoken into existence. And then he formed the earth. Can you, can you not see that Jesus Christ was the creator of this world in Colossians and that the Holy Spirit brought it about as you see it in Genesis 1 as the Spirit of God moved upon the form. You say, Richard, what are you saying to us? I'm saying to you the Holy Spirit created this world and praise be to God, such a big old God as that lives in me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen to me. You say, I can't live the Christian life. You ought to be ashamed. We can all live the Christian life because the biggest God in all the universe, the only God, the true and the living God lives in us. Right. I don't know about you, but I, I glory every day in the fact that God won't let me get away with sin. You say, what do you mean? Sometimes I'm talking to somebody and uh, I'm really mean what I'm saying and I'm telling through the truth, but then there is that pricking in my heart. You need to give them a little more of that truth. You didn't tell the whole story. You just told some of it. Then all of a sudden I have to go back to people. I don't know how many times through my lifetime, how many times I had to go back to people and say, you know, what I just said to you is true, but there's more to it than that. And then I straighten it out. And then I go back with my conscience and the Spirit doing well together again. Let me just say this to you. You cannot sin and get away with it as a child of God. If you're saved and born again, the Holy Spirit is grieved. And you can't live with a grieved Holy Spirit. Show me the man that can live with a grieved wife. How about it? The woman that tried to live with a grieved husband. Well, I'll tell you something worse than that, trying to live with a grieved Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The priority is the Holy Spirit. If you'll listen to the Holy Spirit, you won't grieve your wife. Right. And I'm going to get into that later, probably in some weeks. But for right now, uh, I want to say the meaning. I want to go back and take, we've got about 
few minutes, it's always 12, 15, 12, 30 that I get you out. But it's because I'm teaching you, and, and I hope you do okay with it. But if you got to go, you can just get up and go on and just keep on bothering me. Somebody said, well, you're going to be mad at me. I don't get mad at you. I just think, Lord, what did he miss? Number one, the spirit-filled life is commanded by God. We're at that stage now in this study that last time I preached on a Sunday night, I introduced the concept of being spirit-filled. I want to remind you that being filled with the spirit is absolutely necessary for us to live a victorious Christian life. You can't live for God without the power of God working through you. The meaning of being filled. Again, let me say, a distinction must be made between the positional truth and practical teaching. Positional truth is what we are in Christ. It speaks of our union. You know we live below our provision. Listen to me, you young folk that are struggling all the time. I just can't live victoriously. Well, I know it, but I tell you what, you get passionate enough, you get seeking God enough, you get to draw it nigh to God enough, the Holy Spirit is going to draw nigh to you. Yeah. Again, let me say, a distinction must be made between positional truth, what we are in Christ Jesus. Do you know what I am in Christ Jesus? Eternally saved. Perfect, righteous. Yeah. I'm seen before the throne of God in heaven as being like Christ Jesus. Because when God looks down and sees me, he sees me in his son, Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Amen. That's my position. That never changes. I won't, I won't be saved today and lost tomorrow. There is no condemnation. Amen. Praise God. Understand, your sins are forgiven. But you still have an old sin nature. And I think that's important for us to settle in our thinking. That's the reason we must be spirit-filled. The fact of the believer's position in Christ is important because it is our standing in God. Our position in Christ has to do with our identification with Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. It's amazing that Paul said in the Philippian letter, we're seated in heavenly places, in Ephesians, I mean. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I mean, we're as good as there. Hey, you wonder if I'm going to make it through. Friend, you got a seat reserved if you're genuinely born again. Right. Okay, positionally in Christ means that Christ is the head and we're the body. Amen. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm attached to the eternal God by the new birth and by the grace of God as my hand is in my body. I'm attached to Jesus. Forever. And I didn't start it. He started it. He brought it about by his grace and his power. Amen. It has to do with our union with Christ. Amen. My hand doesn't say, I don't know about tomorrow because I may, I may not be wanted in this body. But I got news for you. The head of this body and every other part of you wants to, to stay around. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's how we are in Christ Jesus. He purposely saved us that we might be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God and we could produce good works for His glory. Amen. Okay. Let me just uh, find me a place here to stop. The Holy Spirit is the Father's gift to every believer at the moment of salvation. Amen. Praise God. We are never commanded to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. 
God doesn't command us to be indwelled. He doesn't command us to be sealed. He doesn't command us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know why? They're His works. And let me just say to you, every saved person is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Every saved person is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Every saved person is baptized by the power of the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. That's His work on us. These all came with our regeneration or our being born again. They are all works of the Holy Spirit that link us positionally in Christ. And at the same time, we believe the Holy Spirit established experientially our union with Christ. Approximately 164 times Paul said, we're in Christ. We're in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. That makes him my armor. Are you thinking a minute with me? Put on the whole armor of Christ. What he starts saying there is start acting like you are already clothed because you're in Christ. Our protection is not our wit against the devil. Now, we're no match for him, but the devil's no match for Jesus, and I'm wearing Jesus as my armor. This speaks of our union in Christ. It is called positional truth. And then there is the command to be filled with the Spirit. And that's that we might experience the practical in our lives. In other words, positional truth is what God has done for us and what we are in Him. That's our union. Practical truth is what God has given us the Holy Spirit for to work out our own salvation with fear and truth. It allows the power of the Spirit of God to live the Christian life through us. Amen. Well, we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. And I'm going to conclude right here in just a moment if you'll be patient with me and then we'll pick this thing back up and go with it again. Because I am dealing with the power of the Holy Spirit you know, it's amazing. He tells us that we will be witnesses in Acts 1 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit of God makes everything that Christ wants accomplished through us possible. Amen. Have you ever wondered, like I do all the time, how in the world did God get me to where I am? He did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. He did it by the power of his sovereign purpose. And we're going to get to the spiritual gifts later on after we study the power of the Holy Spirit. But those spiritual gifts operate in us because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, you're cheating the church when you refuse to be spirit-filled. Some folk think that if I'm saved and I get to heaven, that's all that's necessary. That would be really good if I can just get in up there. Well, I don't believe that's what God wants. He wants us not to get in, but He wants us to live this life in obedience to Him that the Holy Spirit might produce fruit, uh, fruit through us. Okay, But we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. It's interesting the verb, the verb be filled in the original is, uh, is a word that is in the present tense. Now I dealt with this last Sunday night. It's a continual action. God don't want you to be a half-hearted Christian. He wants you to be a whole heart. He wants you not to just kind of work at this thing and be happy that it's as good as it is. God wants it better than you can even imagine. God wants to use you more than you want to be used. My plea is that Peach Street Baptist Church 
will be a church with spirit-filled saints. We'll talk more about it tonight. Hope you'll be here. Good crowd this morning. We thank God for God's helping us get back out again after this pandemic. But I want to say this to you. James A. Stewart used to say, that's Chad Wilkerson's grandfather, greatly used evangelist out of Scotland. And he made this statement, revival is every member of the church, Holy Spirit faith. You say, you mean that the situation is that God has commanded to be, to be spirit filled? Yes. To be controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's the word, the word filled means. To be controlled by the Holy Spirit. We see in Colossians 3.16 to be controlled by the Word of God. Let me plead with you. Let me plead with you. I was in here praying yesterday morning with Chester. And I was calling on the name of the Lord things in my heart because I was preparing for the message this morning it was over and over and over again. Lord Spirit filled Age Tree Baptist Church. You can't just linger. You can't not be active. You cannot be seeking God in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. God wants you to actively engaged in drawing nigh to God. You say, but I'm an old man and I'm tired. He's the Lord of what's left. Amen. Well, I'm a young man and I got a lot of living to do. That's the words of a fool. For there is no promise of tomorrow. You live for today and you must decide today you're going to hold a father. 